Hi, and welcome back to MS Endpoint Manager. This is what's new in Microsoft Intune 2301. Hello. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Good start. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So, so you're back at it. There's a new release out, isn't there? There's a new release. There's a new release every month, actually every week. And uh, we're going to look at some of the stuff that we have uh, in the new build here. So, um, Nikolai, how are you? Well, I'm good. We're, I could have been better. I've been uh, sick for the past few days, so I had to excuse myself. I'm going to be coughing a little bit, but um, I'll try and mute. And if it still gets through, we will edit it out uh, in this uh, <laughs> in this series, so you don't need to listen to that. But I think the first thing we got up on the on this month's release is uh, that we can now see Coffee Manager apps within the company portal. And that's a good uh, good addition to the uh, application uh, management pieces. Exactly. Yeah, and we actually could uh, that for for quite some time if we move the client app flag in uh, the tenant attach or the co-management part um so we should call it cloud attach instead um and uh, well it's it's a great addition to to those who who manage environments uh, having co-management um because then they can have one unified portal um the addition here is that you can actually hide those apps from the company portal. And uh, we're going to show the, you that here in the customization. And if we go edit the settings, um, we can go down here and then we have the config manager applications where we can show and we can hide it. And if we go into the environment, well, first thing is that we of course need to have the cloud attached set up in our config manager environment. And uh, if you want to see more on that part, you can go watch the video with um, with Windows Noob and Paul Winston. Um, we have you covered how to set it up and how to look at co-management. But in my environment here, I have client apps and I have turned that all the way to Intune. And that means I can have both apps from Config Manager and I can have apps from Intune. That's pretty cool. So how does that look on a client? We should well, probably also mention that Windows Noob, that's Niall Brady, so everybody knows. Windows Noob. <laughs> no he's, offense, uh, Niall. He's, uh, he's a very known person. Uh, in he's a very known and very great person. Yeah. Good friend as well. Yes. And software center, we, we know that um, because we've worked with config manager so many years and I have this application that is available for my devices um, and users. I can see that in the software center, but I won't be able to see any application that will be available from Intune. Um, the way to do that is to have the company portal and I, sorry, excuse for the Danish version here of the company portal called Firma Portalen. Um, this is where we go and, and, for example, look at compliance policies, apps, stuff, et cetera, from Intune. And uh, I think this will be the new standard of portals uh, within the um, Intune managed environment. As you can see here, I have a lot more available apps. They, those are coming from, from Intune. We can see the source. Um, how to, to see that it is in tune. You can see administrative uh, source here. And uh, if we go back, we see also the same app, the Intune Debug Toolkit from MS Endpoint Manager. It's right here. So this new feature within the 2301 is that I can hide this. As, and uh, let's see how that is done by hiding that and reviewing and saving it. And well, it's really uh, fast. it is really that fast. Um, wow. Yeah. Is um, that a first? <laughs> <laughs> Something just works out of the box and it's instant. Uh, yeah, it's instant. Let's it's the uh, power of the sure. cloud, right? It or is the power like of the cloud. And because when we authenticate to the um, 
uh, company portal. Uh, I don't have to sync my device and, and do other stuff. <laughs> it's It should automatically just be, be hidden now. Let's see if that is the case. And you can no longer see my Intune debug toolkit within the company portal. So this is the new feature of 2301. That's pretty slick. It actually was that fast. Impressive. It was. Yeah. 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 I would have expected you to at least restart the feed up protocol or company portal a few times and, and made a sync or something. But then again, I mean, it does go out and refreshes everything from the user perspective when you go in there. So that's a cool, that's a cool yeah. enhancement. Definitely. I think so. Very usable. Yeah. So, yeah. Nikolai, on to the next uh, subject of uh, 2021. <clears throat> so and this one um, we discussed a little bit prior to, to having setting this all up and recording this. Um, so enrollment notifications when you enroll a new device for the user is now sent out and it's in general availability. Previously, it's been in uh, preview for some time. Um, and I'll be honest, uh, I'm probably missing something here uh, that I don't really <laughs> know perhaps, but I, I fail to see the benefits of this or at least the, the, where the where the applicability goes, right? Why should we send these notifications to the users? There may be use cases where I've not had the opportunity as a consultant to, to work with uh, that sort of engagements, but I would definitely not like to send out an email to my user saying that, hey, you know what? You just completed the autopilot provisioning flow and, and you're on the desktop and you started Outlook for the first time. Here's an email that you actually did all that. Right, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm like I said, I'm probably missing some sort of scenarios or use cases, but but I mean, there's definitely probably a good scenario for this where it fits. But that's the, the, that's my opinion about this. I'm not really sure how we uh, where I work would apply this or make use of it, unless that it gets extended with new capabilities in the future that might interest us or pique some interest at least. Mm. Yeah, I, I think it's actually written here what, what the purpose of this is. Um, the notification improves security mm. by notifying users if someone enrolls a device with their credentials. Yeah. And <clears throat> However, that might I, be the use case. Yeah, but then again, do you, <clears throat> do you trust your users to take action on it? I don't know what I would do <laughs> if I was the user, actually. So... I, I, right. I would probably have more faith in, in the respective security teams having sort of a criteria set up to, to trigger alerts on these sort of. So if someone in, I don't know, in, in let's take uh, Thailand, for instance, you know, uh, nothing against Thailand. I love it. It's a good holiday vacation like, country to visit. Um, enrolled advice with my credentials. And then I did the same here in Sweden. Obviously, if that happened within... I don't know, six hours uh, in between, that's not possible to travel, right, or, or similar like that. Mm -hmm. and then something is obviously not uh, in a correct state and, and that should be investigated. But, but then again, I mean, it's like we discussed previously, that from the security standpoint, that's the only potential benefit I can see from this. But then again, I would not trust the users to take action on this and, and register tickets or similar to that, that, hey, you know what? someone is enrolling a device for me. Oh, cool. Because I would assume half of the users, at least <laughs> where, where I work, they would just delete the email and say, I don't know what that is. That's probably spam, right? Yeah. Uh, and if we put all the uh, bells and whistles from the company branding and communication standards uh, into the email, if that's possible. Um, can we look into that pretty quickly? Because I have- Yeah, we can. Um... So I've set this up prior to, to this. And uh, as you can see, we have a push notification and we have email notification. And the thing about the push, uh, it, it's not supported on Windows, um, at least what, what I could read about it. Um, so the email notification is the one we are going to uh, see when we um, enroll a device uh, into the tenant. So there's a, a way of, of making a pretty slick HTML uh, email for, yeah, 
for uh, I mean it's it's great to put in you know uh, things cool. look good <laughs> and and stuff yeah this is pretty cool this is a, a demo hello world and all that kind of stuff right and the other thing is if you like to have uh, logos and stuff and like you have to go into the customization where we were before where I hide it the app from from company portal they will have all the uh, company branding stuff that will go into the email but um how does it look actually um um well we will have an email that looks like this and as you can see i haven't done the company branding at my site but i can see who the user were which device it was i can click on details and it will take me to the online version of the company portal where i can see and call help desk and, and do stuff as i showed you in the company portal before um i can yeah this this is how it works um basically there's maybe we can at least summarize saying that <clears throat> Definitely, some users would definitely be suspicious about this activity if they receive this email, and if they do the sort of validation of the email um, and eventually click on the link. Um, mm. And I think that yeah, this shouldn't have happened. I've not enrolled any device. Some users may essentially call their support desk or help desk or register security tickets or however that works within the organization. <clears throat> so I mean, exactly. yeah, we could. I can definitely see uh, that sort of use case uh, security perspective, but other than that, yeah. And um... yeah, so um, on to the next feature. On to the next feature. Yeah. It's one of your favorites. I really like it because um, there are certain environments or uh, device types, I would say, OS types that you cannot enroll to Intune. Uh, it's, it's, it's known that servers, for example, you can't enroll that to Intune. And I don't think it's, it will at any time in, in the future because we have lots of good uh, management tools for servers like uh, Azure Arc or such environments that will be able to take care of, of the server side of stuff or things. But, but, but we have this portal called um, Microsoft Defender for Endpoint, a way we can uh, have detect and response. And uh, that is definitely capable of, of, of doing servers, et cetera. And um, many, many, many customers or companies out there are already utilizing uh, MDE. And <clears throat> this new feature that we got is a, a way of applying policies from Intune to a server or a client that has not been enrolled to Intune. Yes, it's not enrolled in Intune. So how can we, how can I, I, I couldn't understand it to begin with, uh, <laughs> obviously. How can you push something and you're not enrolled to Intune? It's because they build a bridge that, um, of course, you need to have a, a uh, Azure AD registration or object. Otherwise, this is not uh, doable. So your server or client must be hybrid or at least uh, Azure AD joint. Um, and then it's it's going to trust that object and push these policies uh, through the MDE channel. And how does that look if we go into the endpoint security, which by the way, is the only way to push these kind of um, policies. We can go to the attack surface reduction rules. And uh, what you can see is the target out here. You might have seen that there are several uh, interfaces on the antivirus part where it says something else than MDE or MDM. If we go create, now we suddenly have three possibilities here, and it can be somewhat difficult to find out what is what. Well, if you use the config manager, it's it's given that the policy is, is going to utilize the tenant attached feature we have. If we're going to use the Windows 10 and later, we only use the MDM channel. If we use the Windows 10, 11, and Windows Server, we are utilizing the um, MDE channel, so to speak. And uh, let's see how that actually looks like when we created it.
for the demo sake. And let's just take one um, rule here. Um, click next, next. And we are not going to assign it because we will only look at how the target looks like. And now all of a sudden we see that the target now is MDM and Microsoft Sense. And the Microsoft Sense is the uh, sensor on, on the system that is utilized by MDE. And that way it's going to uh, fetch the rule and actually apply it on the device. So all of a sudden we can actually apply policies to devices that are not enrolled in Intune. We could do that on antivirus and some other stuff before, but now having the ASR rules is actually uh, close to, to feature complete how uh, and what you want to control uh, through, um, yeah, of policies. And I really, really, really like this. Um, I've tested it on servers and it actually works really, really great. I don't have a working sample, Nikolai, unfortunately. Um, I would so like to show you that, but um, <coughs> it takes time to set up these kind of stuff. So um, yeah, it does for sure. But I think this is extremely cool. Um, it's a really easy way to just, you know, target your policies towards your service as well and, and make sure that they follow the uh, security baselines that you have out there. Yeah. Um, so I just want briefly to show the, the overview here. And this is truly the unified endpoint security management experience because now all of a sudden we can, we can have all the cloud only devices, we can have the co-managed devices and we can have uh, cross platforms and suddenly we can utilize the config manager through the tenant attach and we can utilize the MDE through the MDE channel. So uh, three ways in one simple policy. Could we call it MDE attach perhaps? MDE that attach, really that sounds like the real world uh, word here. Yeah, yeah. Cool. So next up then. I know we talked about this in the last video, right? Where we mentioned we that Panasonic has been added to the DSCI configuration options. And uh, this month, there is actually a new vendor that has been onboarded. Um, so I think that we the, the crystal ball that you looked in, <laughs> it actually came through. <laughs> so that's interesting. It is. And uh, that's pretty slick because more and more vendors is, is coming into this kind of configuration. So uh, that's uh, that's quite cool. And uh, we showed you uh, how and what the FCI is. So if you want to know more, then go look in the older version of what's new in Intune and uh, watch that. Exactly. I think let's move on to the next one, right? Yeah. This one is a so big one, I think. This is really, really cool. I think the um, the uh, this request has been on 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 the top three priority from from everybody out there uh, when it talk when it comes to filters. Uh, I know my top priority is autopilot group tags. Uh, it's not there yet, but at least the device trust type so that you can filter between how the um, uh, how the device is actually um, registered with Azure AD, and that that's a good. Uh, Good thing. It is. And um, let's face it, there are so many customers out there that, that runs in a hybrid environment. And exactly. uh, their journey is maybe doing the hybrid world for some time. And then all the new devices coming in will yeah. be Azure AD <laughs> joined only, right? And instead of creating Azure AD groups, right, that, that looks at this uh, trust type um, and, and divide your stuff there, it, it's rather slow of dealing with dynamic groups. So I mean, having this extension to the uh, to the filter options within um, within Intune directly, it's way faster. It's it's uh, yeah, it's very slick. It's it's a really good improvement for Microsoft. So thumbs up, to be honest. Yeah, exactly. And as you said, the uh, dynamic rule that it, there's a SLA on 24 hours, so you can't really <laughs> ensure that it's it's fairly quick to update devices. So. If yeah. you want to to make a fast way of of um, making sure your your policies is getting out there, um, <clears throat> it's filters that you need to to operate with. Definitely, and then That's great one, let's right? look. Yeah, let's look at the filters. Um, <clears throat> there are 
different ways to get into the filter, actually. Uh, we could click devices and go to filters. We could click tenant administration and, and go to filters, etc. cetera. Um, so let's go and create a filter. Um, trust type, let's call it trust type and then uh, AAD only. And we select the platform and we have this device trust type and we will put it to equals. And then we have a drop down to say, what types of device trust type do we have? We have Azure AD joint, which is the pure Azure AD. Uh, we have the Azure AD registered, which would be kind of a uh, iOS device, uh, that type of, of devices. We would have hybrid Azure AD joint, which is the AD joint device, which has AD connect to sync up the device. And then we have unknown Nikolai. And I, I've looked into that and I'm, I was very surprised. <clears throat> yeah, we will potentially revisit that with an answer in the next video if we get one. But I just need to make a note here. I think that, that the, the sort of drop down here with, with the human readable and understandable options, instead of being having to, to put in the actual, let's say graph value representation, that is a good uh, good improvement because otherwise for hybrid Azure AD doing, you would have to write in a text field server AD, which makes no sense. Um, mm. Obviously it does make a little bit of sense, but but it's not something that you would you know think of in the first time uh, when you wanted to enter something. So that <clears throat> having these drop downs instead with the actual readable, oh yeah, I want the hybrid ones or I want the Azure AD ones only. Yeah, that, that that's really good. So I like that. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And, and we can actually see the joint types here. We have a hybrid Azure AD, we have a Azure AD joint, and we have a Azure AD registered device. So it's actually exactly how it looks like in the um, Azure AD portal. But uh, we can uh, definitely do that. And when you click outside the drop down, it, it, it gets down to the real syntax. And uh, then we can preview the devices just to make sure that our filter is actually doing whatever we thought it would do. And we can get surprised of how many uh, devices we have that is pure Azure AD joint. Or we could say, yes, this was actually uh, what I was <laughs> thinking. Uh, <laughs> sure. um, yeah. and and. At, the great part here is that we have this preview. I really like it because we are pretty certain that the filter will apply properly uh, with the preview and, and see what will happen inside our environment. But uh, Nikolai, how are we utilizing these filters? Um, there, there is some, some common thump, uh, rules of thump uh, when we deploy uh, policies, right? Um, and if we deploy to this uh, dynamic Azure AD group, uh, we just uh, told those who watched the video here that there can be times where a device will have a long period not being part of that Azure AD group. And the thing is, we can't really wait if it's, uh, it's, it's the configuration you want to push out to the device right now. How can we, how can we do that? And that's where the filter actually uh, comes into place. Um, let's just see how that works, right? Um, we can deploy this to a Azure AD group, or we could use the virtual group that is called all devices, which is actually the preferred way to, to deploy and then uh, put on a filter and include uh, the kind of filter you would like. And that way you can have a simple assigning strategy and only target devices that you want to target. Isn't that the preferred way, Nikolai? It sure is. Yeah. And uh, I think the message think here is not use groups, essentially. Yeah. I can guarantee that the policy will get out there much faster doing it this way. Great. That was filter app and policy assignment. And thank you, Scott Duffy, for that. It's a great addition to Intune. It sure is. And next up, we got some Winget troubleshooting. What have you prepared for us, Matthias? Ah, Winget. I love it. Winget. Yeah. Last it's, time. It's, it's like Last the next we... uh, thing after sliced bread, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. We, we, we need something to eat. But um, 
<laughs> Win Wingate, the the new uh, we shouldn't call it the new store. The new store is is that's that's not a thing. It's the same store. No it's it's the a new store. API integration from Intune, right? And um, if we go to apps and we go to Windows, for example, and we click at, I showed you that last time, the Microsoft Store app new, and that is what trigger people, I I guess, because. There is no new store. There's a new integration <laughs> from Intune to the store. The backend is the same. We just have new possibilities. And what we should really, you know, uh, remember here is that what you're selecting is an app type that is connected to a backend service through an API, right? So mm -hmm. it's exactly as you say. It's not a new store in any sort of way. Yeah. Um, but uh, the thing is, I cheated as I like to do. I created a uh, app uh, beforehand, and uh, it is it is called Note as Stick, Notepad, and <clears throat> in the backend it is a MSIX package, and um, we've given some new troubleshooting tips that we can utilize um, when we have this kind of of wit get installation um, stuff. So if I go to the company portal, I would have uh, no clue where to look uh, before this uh, debug thing came around. Uh, but now I have. There will be a place here in, in uh, temp for your user where you will have a new folder called WinGet. And there will be some event logs that you can uh, utilize the Apex deployment operational and the Apex deployment server uh, operational. So when I install this application, and it's not even when it's trouble uh, troubling you, um, this is for every installation that has anything to do with WinGet, it will create this um, troubleshooting uh, uh, you could say uh, area of stuff uh, in the event log and in in the temp folder. So, so you would actually be able to uh, see what happened. Um, yeah, and let's just uh, see it working. You can see now it created my WinGet folder, and we have a default state. And here we have been given a document. Uh, we'll look into that when it's finalized the installation and um, see what's inside that little fella. Come on, come on, come on. Almost there. Almost there. Yeah. It's installed. And uh, we got this. A uh, fine little uh, log file. We can see the uh, command line argument that it created. Um, and well, yeah, it's not much, but it is something. And if you have troubles with your installations, now you know where to go and look for troubles. And it's, it's much easier for the uh, engineering team to actually do something about it when you have uh, logs that um, you can show uh, of proof. And the Something other right there that you can see, Matthias, in the um, log files <clears throat> yeah. on the row that you selected is that it's not essentially the, the <clears throat> Windows Package Manager executables that's being executed, right? You can see it's the IME, the agent executor. And that is basically because it has the whole library of Win uh, of <clears throat> WinGet built into it. That's also the way that we can leverage this through the provisioning flows and stuff. And eventually, hopefully, be able to track this during the ESP because the IME will have this functionality to manage WinGet applications or um, applications through WinGet by by having it built into itself, which I think is a great um, a great path that they have taken to integrate this directly uh, instead of having to have this you know uh, external piece that needs to be on the device before it can do, uh, start managing these things. So I really like the path that they're taking, how to integrate this. I think it's a it's a good way of, uh, of dealing with it. Yeah. So just a side note here, I think it's worth mentioning. 
Yeah, exactly. And there the, 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 the might be some, some policies that you would like to add to your environment to make sure that this is the, the Winget stuff here is, is managed. And uh, Jürgen Nilsson actually created a brilliant post, uh, what policies you need to, to add to your environment to be able to install Winget packages from Intune, but not as a user on the device. So if you want to look that up, uh, go to CCM exec and uh, find his blog post on that. Uh, the other thing is that we can look up these things in the event log uh, eventually um, to see uh, the app installation. And we can see uh, some stuff about dependencies and, and et cetera. Um, we know apps have dependencies to, to other apps uh, or stuff that needs to be on the device before uh, installation happens. And, and there's just no different for, for this one. And uh, we can see exactly what has happened throughout the uh, installation of this package. And I think this is very cool, right, Nikolai? Absolutely. It's a great addition because troubleshooting store apps in the past hasn't been the most uh, easiest way <laughs> more easiest task to to embark on so yeah great additions definitely yeah so that's um winget and i must say intune is just getting better and better um and they really listen to feedback so so keep getting this feedback to to the team and uh, we can improve um, all the services that are implemented yeah, and I, I think that the combination here before we go into the next topic is that you have it in the event logs. If you prefer that, that's great. But you also have the text file, right, or the log file. So yeah. whatever you prefer, you you can you can go look at the respective um, troubleshooting path that that suits you. Exactly. Sweet. So yes, um, <clears throat> there's also a new report in this release for devices without a compliance policy assigned. There definitely is, and uh, we should uh, go look at that. Uh, if we go to reports, we have um, the device compliance, and we have this device without compliance policy. Um, there is centrally in Intune, there's a policy uh, where you can, or setting where you can actually say, if your device have no compliance policy, make it non-compliant. And exactly. uh, you should put that on. It shouldn't yeah. be compliant by default, right? Exactly. But uh, this report. No way of measuring exactly what you're doing on the other devices. Yeah. Uh, and when we talk about feedback, <laughs> when you have this dark mode enabled and you go into these uh, reports, parts of the portal, and you highlight it, I mean, come on, uh, CSS, how, how hard can it be? Change the text so that it's readable <laughs> so it doesn't just turn white. <laughs> um, anyways. It's, it's just something that annoys me because I really like the dark mode, but I, yeah, I cannot understand why that hasn't been fixed yet. Yeah, but um, there's so many things, right, Nikolai? Um, Do you mean there's so many things to fix or there's so much new stuff to implement? <laughs> <laughs> no comment. No comment. Yay. No comment. Yeah. Um, I have several bugs in the UI that I have um, made some feedback on, but um for there sure. are other priorities, and I can understand that because uh, lots of, of people want new stuff, and uh, we want, of course, um, to onboard uh, companies that has blockers and stuff. So there's a very natural uh, <laughs> way of prioritizing uh, work within the group. But um, the thing here is that devices without a compliance policy are currently marked uh, compliant, and I could change that setting. Uh, that's pretty slick because that was what I just said you shouldn't have in your environment, and I have it in mind. So thank you. I was just going to say that. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm a bad teacher. I'm a bad teacher. <laughs> but the mechanic he 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 um he drives in a in a, in a re really bad car, you know. Uh, that's how it is. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's a great overview, and I've I've missed ways to actually get devices that are non-compliant in one big view and why. And it's still a why because I can't see uh, exactly what's going on. I would like maybe a a. Uh, 
row or something that I, I could actually see the reason why this um, uh, device was was non-compliant. Is it actually because it's lacking a compliance policy? Is it because I set up it should have BitLocker enabled and it's not BitLocked or what is it? It, it, it could be a great addition to this report. And, but there is also the case where, I mean, for instance, if you have <coughs> HoloLens devices or you have um, <coughs> other sorts of uh, Surface devices, like Surface Hubs and, and similar like that, <coughs> that you could potentially have missed if you used filters or if you had a dynamic group to only include OS windows or similar, uh, and then you made a target of your compliance policy towards that sort of group or filter. Um, now with this report, we can at least see, oh, wow, we are not targeting this particular OS, right? And that's probably bad or intentional. I don't know, but at least <laughs> a, a, a good you know, starting point to, to look at these um, devices. And then from, from that point, go and have a look more deep to, to understand, okay, why are this particular device not targeted depending on your assignment strategy that you have? Mm. So I think it, it's because it, this has been really tricky in the past. You had to go and build a lot of queries or, or a PowerShell scripts to figure this out and then get some good, some sort of good report based on it. So, so this is a great, uh, great improvement, I would say. Yeah, yeah. And again, we're just uh, getting more and more goodies into the system, and this is just going on week by week by week and month by month. So this really the benefit of being in the cloud. Yeah, definitely. But fix the CSS styling issue. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, yeah. I think um, we should uh, move on to the next one, unless you had anything else. No, I am. Um... Good. Because we need to talk about service health messages. Yeah. Service health messages. This is a overlooked uh, pain, I would say. Uh, I'm not looking at the same. I don't think many people go in here and look at this, but it's extremely powerful. It is, and uh, it's not a common uh, overview. So my tenant won't show the same as your tenant because it is aware of the connectors you have and stuff that goes out of support and it will report to you to say, hey, uh, you have Cisco eyes and it's in a, in, a, in an old state and we will deprecate uh, all versions of ice, for example. Um, that could be the case. So if you have an Intune environment, this is something you should look at at least once a week. Yeah, definitely. But I mean, it will also show you different, you know, if, if your tenant is in a specific region or or on a particular scaling unit within Intune that's currently affected by a certain issue or incident ongoing, um, while my tenant is on another different region or scale, scale unit, we would have different information in here. So, I mean, just like you say, Matthias, it's really, really important that you look into these things and, and you know, Keep an eye on this because this is where you'll get really good information on what's going on. If there's a global outage of Intune, hopefully not, but or region-wise or or even smaller ones as well, <clears throat> um, yeah. affecting your environment. That is. Yeah, and then, and the the new thing here is the issues in your environment that require action. That 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 is definitely new. I haven't seen that before. Nope. So um, yeah, before so we, we have had issues, the message sent. <laughs> yeah, yep. You know, you want to know if you if you have uh, issues, um, right? Uh, it shouldn't be hide it somewhere and say we never have issues. Of course you have. Uh, of course someone puts bad code into the system. Of course, uh, network is down time from time to time. Of course DNS can can uh, do bad stuff and. And so forth. Uh, we know this from on-prem. So why shouldn't uh, these things also happen in cloud? Definitely. <clears throat> yeah. Cool. Um, and I think from this report to the Intune troubleshooting, um, we got a new Intune troubleshooting uh, site here. 
Oh, um, you went on to that. I thought that we were going to talk about multiple <coughs> multiple certificate connectors, but we can do yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, because uh, it really makes sense and it, it is in mm. the same area, kind of. Um, Absolutely. And before when we did, uh, and this is also very uh, overlooked, uh, I think, um, to, to actually see what happens on a, a given user and what client apps it has assigned and devices assigned to this user. It's, it's, it's bringing you a good overview, but, but Nikolai, this we have had for a very long time, right? We uh, have, the, yeah, for sure. The new thing here is the preview here, we can try it now, and then we can have a brand new experience uh, within uh, the top troubleshooting. And, and now I will uh, look up my user here, and I will um, do the same as I did before. And as you can see, I got a lot more information in my portal. And this is this is actually amazing. I, I really love it. Uh, I can see on, on, on the compliant side, which policies is, is actually compliant on, on all of my devices. Um, I can, if I had conflicts, I can go and see these conflicts. Uh, Compliance policies can go and see why my devices are non-compliant. You can see the state here is in error, and that's of course the default device compliance policy where I have not assigned a compliance policy. And applications, which I see from time to time, is a big issue for people. Uh, stuff not coming down from the cloud. It says something pending. Um, give you an overview of what, what's actually happening. And then least but not last, the roles and scopes, Nikolai, that is a game changer, right? What role is your user part of? This is a global admin. Ooh. And which scopes do you have? Password spray on your account, right? <laughs> <laughs> nah. Yeah. So I'm global I, I, admin I and, and I have <laughs> no compliance policy. Don't do this at home. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> now, but I, I um, <clears throat> right now, I mean, what happens if you go into the device, right, and, and filter by device next to the user? What if you put in a device there? Oh, in, uh, in the uh, top. Oh, in the top. And I put in a device over here. Uh, just the right to your over here. Screen. Okay. There you go. Oh. So this is pretty slick, right? You don't have to type anything. You can just uh, select one. So what if yeah. you selected a Windows device, right? This is, is a, uh, that was a Windows 365. Oh, yeah. Okay, just anyone. It actually says Windows underneath, and that's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah. Yeah. What, what I would like to see in here is that this UI would have been a little bit more dynamic. For app protection policies for Windows, mm, not a big thing. Um, sure, enrollment restrictions, then, yeah, that's good. The diagnostics part, that's really interesting, to be fair. Um, and so forth um but i mean um yeah a little bit more agnostic to what sort of device you have selected and what sort of windows up op or sorry operating system that that device has and then build up these tabs accordingly that's the sort of feedback that i presented when we uh, previewed this um <clears throat> which is uh, but generally, this is a, a really great improvement uh, to, to the previous experience. Um, hmm. And it will definitely help uh, a lot from the help desk perspective to, to be able to, in more depth, look at, OK, what is this device that the user has, right? Um, and maybe in the long term, you could actually integrate this with your uh, ITSM systems or, or similar. or. Um, <clears throat> or help desk solutions or whatever software you're using to um, to provide support. So that's cool. Yeah, and just uh, a little side note here, Nikolai. It's, it's not been able to to actually go to your device and see a feature update policy. Uh, that, that, that isn't shown on the device pane under the configuration profiles. Um, it's actually shown here, I see. Uh, the update ring, you can't, you can see that on the config. Um, let's go see that. Um, so you know what I mean? Yeah, I feel lost now. I don't know what you mean. <laughs> no, exactly. So I have to show you. And uh, thank you. Now it's loading slowly. And uh, OK, here we have it. 
And oh, so let's yeah, yeah, yeah. Device sure. configuration. This is my overview of all my configuration on my device. But uh, you see my quality update here. That is my update ring. That is applied. But what you don't see is the feature update policy that I applied to this device. Um, so you can't actually see why my device would probably upgrade to Windows 11 or maybe the next build of Windows 11. Um, you can see that from the troubleshooting pane. And that's a brand new experience I haven't seen before. Here we have it. Very, very cool. Thank you. It is. This, this is what we need, more of this stuff. Yes. A good way to understand how a device actually is going to um, <clears throat> be configured or upgraded or any other way. Yeah. Affected by the policies that we apply. It's really good. Mm -hmm. Cool. And should we uh, should should we talk about it? The yeah, let's, yeah, let's 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 do, let's, let's do it. Let's do it. Because in the uh, what's new section for this month, there is a. Uh, a section in there saying that we now have a preview capabilities of the PowerShell script package content in Endpoint Analytics. And uh, yeah, if you try to find it there, or has it been removed now? Or is it no, 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 no. It's, the, it's here. Where is it? Where is it? Ah, it's, uh, it's bugging. There, there it is. is. So admins can now see a preview of the PowerShell scripts content for proactive remediations. I recall, and you recall as well, that we have been able to do this for a very long time, right? So we thought that we would just simply uh, show you that this is possible <laughs> and has been for a very long time. Because when I when we wrote the, uh, the documentations for the, the Cloud Labs community solutions that we developed, we, um, we, we took a print screens of the endpoint analytics uh, and proactive remediation script package. And this is how it looks, and this is how it still looks. So we think that this is simply just uh, a commit error in the uh, WhatsApp, WhatsApp, <laughs> what's new section uh, to Intune. No, I don't use WhatsApp. Um, so anyway, just a funny uh, note rounding things off. And uh, with that, we don't really have that much news this week other than a um, a uh, tip for reading a really good blog post from Scott that we think is worth worth your while. Uh, and it talks about the primary user and how it functions and when to use it. And and also goes it goes really deep into into the context of this. So it's a really recommended read if if you have 10 to 15 minutes spare time of your busy days. So have a read at it. We will uh, put the link in the description or comments or section afterwards. Matthias will fix it. He knows YouTube better than I do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still learning. Yeah, cool. Nikolai, this was a, a great experience. This was the second What's New in Microsoft Intune, and we're very much looking forward to uh, deliver uh, such a session every month uh, covering What's New on the Windows side. Uh, in the Microsoft Intune portal. Definitely. Thank you, Matthias. Thank you, Nikolai. And see you. See you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.